Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, building MPC wallets. Um, the, what I'm going to try to do is first uh, convince you that in, in, for this specific problem, MPC uh, is a very, uh, it's like, a, I guess, a perfect match, I would say. And, uh, but then I'd like to show you why it's no, nowhere near as easy as it looks. Like, you may think, no problem, I find my favorite uh, uh, signing uh, protocol, and I plug it in, and everything is done. But there are a lot of subtleties and a lot of challenges, and I'll show you also some solutions that we have for it. And uh, I won't have a specific open problem uh, uh, section, but you'll see very easily as I go on that there are many, many things to be done here. Okay, and this uh, is all, you know, work out of discussions and, and things that we've done with the team at the Coinbase Cryptography team and with others over the years. Yeah? When you publish the threads? I think they're online. No, I sent them last night. Oh, the organizers. Um, I sent them last night, so they just need to be uploaded. Uh, okay, so I want to start talking about the self-custody dilemma, at least that's what I call it. Um, so when we talk about self-custody, we talk about a situation where the user holds their key. So you hold your key on your mobile device, on your laptop, maybe you have a separate hardware device. You hold your key, and the advantages of this are, are as follows. Firstly, the... Um, the statement, you know, your keys, your coins, that can be a catchphrase, but there are actual, there, there are real ramifications to this. Nobody can censor you um, or prevent you from using your keys under subpoena and so on and so forth. To be honest with you, I'm not really that interested in working really hard on science to help criminals get away, uh, uh, avoid subpoenas. But there are a lot of people in the world that live in countries where, uh, um, you know, this is, a, this is a, a real issue. I'll just give one example. You're living in Afghanistan and the Taliban is about to come in. What do you do with your money? And people indeed bought Bitcoin with uh, their money in order to have it not be confiscated. So uh, the, this, in some parts of the world, this is a, a, a real issue. Uh, a second reason is you're not reliant on a central organization and you don't lose your money if they go bankrupt. And although Dan sort of hinted all the time, I would say FTX, uh, because we all know of this and it's, uh, it's extremely painful. Right? This is, uh, it, it, I, I really, I, I think that this is terrible for the field, that there are organizations that are so negligent with people's money. Uh, I can tell you that when I was uh, um, working in university and uh, the worst, the two worst things you can have, you can do is maybe you'll uh, fail someone or pass someone you shouldn't have, but then they'll always appeal and you'll pass them anyway. Or you'll have a bug in your theoretical paper, you know, not great, it's a bit embarrassing, but when you're responsible for protecting people's money that they put into their college funds or their pension funds or, or whatever it is, that, that it, it requires a level of responsibility that shouldn't be, uh, um, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't ignore. There are other things, there are other types of assets like NFT, NFTs that are not really aligned with a centralized exchange. Now, that's just because of the way they work. Most centralized exchanges take uh, all of the customer's money and put them in certain pools. Now, they could hold a separate key for every customer for every asset, but it's just typically not the way it works and therefore it's not really aligned. Uh, what are the disadvantages of uh, self-custody? So first, firstly, and I think first and foremost, usability, you are responsible. Um, you have to back up your seed, your mnemonic or whatever it is, and if you lose it, then you lose all of your money. And I like to say there's only one thing worse than someone stealing $100,000 from you, and that's you losing $100,000. And um, the interesting thing is security and backup actually are at direct odds with each other. Because the best way to prevent my mnemonic or seed being stolen is to back it up in many, many places. But the more places I back it up, the more vulnerable it is to, get to, to being stolen. And we think about having $50, maybe it's not such a big deal, but if I had a million dollars in a wallet somewhere, it's really nerve-wracking. Like, how, how do I make sure that I don't lose this, that it doesn't get stolen, that I back it up in the right way? Where am I going to put it? I'm certainly not putting my key to a million dollars in iCloud. Um, and, and interestingly, there are actually many stories of customers calling up exchanges 
uh, for their self-custody wallet and asking for a password reset and being absolutely shocked when they're told, sorry, it doesn't work that way. If you wanted to get a password reset, you would have to use the exchange service, not the self-custody wallet. There's a self-custody wallet. There is no such thing as a password reset. We're sorry, you've lost all of your money. This is not what users expect. Uh, they expect their wallet app on their phone to behave like their banking app, and it just doesn't. It behaves in a completely different way. Um, from a security perspective, user devices are not great. I have a pretty high-end iPhone. It's good security-wise. I'm still not sure I'd want to put a million dollars on there uh, in, in the event of any malware being able to uh, steal from my phone. So social engineering, crypto wallets have mnemonics. Again, the mnemonic you use to back up your seed. As soon as you have a mnemonic, you are vulnerable, and it's something you can give to others, you're vulnerable to social engineering, and people in general are vulnerable to social engineering. Very vulnerable to social engineering. And, uh, yeah, back up, I talked about it already. So just think about you being a non-expert user and how scary it is to go through this sign-up process. Okay, warning, never disclose your backup phrase. Anyone with this phrase can take your ether forever. It's pretty scary, like, when you're signing up, right? It's like signing up to, you know, going to your bank and the bank telling you, listen, just know there's this secret here. If you lose it, we're not responsible for your money. Uh, or here, uh, uh, so I, I have my recovery phase, and it says backup to iCloud or backup manually. W which should I choose? What should I do? Um, and here's something like, who knows what this means? BIP39 seeds can be important in Electrum, so users can, fund, can unlock funds in other wallets, but we do not generate BIP39 seeds because they don't meet our safety standards. Like, this is not for the everyday person. If we want cryptocurrencies and blockchain uh, uh, applications to be for everyone, then they have to be uh, uh, something that everybody can use. Or again, I understand that if I lose my recovery phrase, I lose all of my crypto in my wallet. Great. Uh, social engineering, these are things done against Ledger. Uh, you have a problem with your hardware and it's to be updated, please input your mnemonic so we can fix your hardware. Many people are going to fall for that sort of uh, thing. It, it's, uh, if done well, these are very, very effective. I'm not talking about stupid Nigerian emails. I'm talking about targeted uh, phishing can be very, very effective. And again, we're talking about the fact that if we want this to be en masse, then this is a huge concern. Okay, so, the other, so the, what's the other option? Let's go to exchanges and custody. If it's hard for the user to hold themselves, then the exchange or the custodian will hold uh, their funds for them. The advantages of this is that the uh, uh, burden of management and security is on the exchange, and good exchanges and good enterprises that care about security and are transparent are going always to be much, much better at holding and protecting keys than mo the vast majority of end users. Um, in addition, you can, do, you can add additional mechanisms like anti-fraud, uh, step-up authentication for high amounts, right? Or things that you get from your credit card company, you can expect to get also from your exchange to help limit your exposure in the case of, uh, uh, of an attack. You can have a password reset, for example, which people are expecting. I talked about beforehand. You can have policies on the amounts you're going to allow to, tra to transfer or allow lists and so on and so forth. What are the disadvantages? Not all exchanges are equal. Um, again, if the exchange goes bankrupt, then you can lose all of your money. Um, it's also somewhat true, of course, of regular banks, but there's a much more regulation and support around regular banks to prevent this from happening. Uh, another reason which is a disadvantage, maybe it's a philosophical one or, may not, or, or may, maybe not, but if it's uh, uh, the whole point of this field is decentralization, so if it's not decentralized, then maybe why bother? I don't know if I agree or not. Uh, but in general, again, uh, FTX, Celsius, Three Arrows, just recent, uh, uh, recent events of, uh, of bankrupt organizations losing their money. By the way, not all exchanges who uh, have gone bankrupt is because they're negligent. There's uh, one very specific one who I think everyone thinks were really good, but uh, they were supported by FTX and therefore went down with them. 
Uh, but it can be really, really ugly, like there are cases where it seems that people lost their money but still had earnings reported, so still had, a, uh, had to pay the IRS. Uh, this is, you know, a, a very big concern. But I do want to say one thing that I, I think we need to put on the table, and that is when I choose where to put my money, I would put it in Citibank and not in Sam's Bank of the Bahamas. And I think that's also true of of exchanges. So not all exchanges are equal, and I think that if people are also careless with their own money in this field as well, and I don't think we should ignore that. So the, the, the self-custody dilemma, as I put it, is that if we want everybody, or at least the masses, to use this technology, then we have to solve this problem. And solving this problem means that we want to provide self-custody with the experience of an exchange. And uh, uh, self-custody, again, for all the reasons that I said, there are also some legal issues here, which I'm not sure everyone's familiar with, so I'll just say them. Uh, if I hold my keys, uh, or at least it, it depends, because there's self-custody, there's full custody, and there's non-custodial, but if, I, if at least the, 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 the exchange doesn't have the ability to carry out uh, operations without me, then this means that the money isn't actually at the exchange. The exchange doesn't hold my money. That means if they go bankrupt, then I am not just another uh, creditor like everybody else. Whereas if my money is actually at the exchange, then uh, maybe the exchange would like to give me my money back first, but actually they cannot because they have debts to everybody and I just go into the list with everybody else. So we want to get self-custody with the experience of an exchange. I also want to stress that I personally don't think this is an exclusive or situation. Uh, some people are very purist on one or the other. The purists are usually more on the self-custody side. But personally, I want to be able to hold money directly. I think that's one of the big utilities of this field, being able to hold money directly and transact with money directly. But to be honest, I don't want to put all my money in my wallet. I don't walk around with my backpack full of uh, $100 bills. And uh, I also wouldn't want to do that as well. I would want to have both, but that's sort of a bit out of the, uh, um, out of the scope of this talk. Okay, so in my opinion, MPC actually gives us uh, uh, a very, very good solution to this exact problem of being able to build something which is self-custodial, at least non-custodial, and uh, with the experience of an exchange, user experience of an exchange. Okay, so just generally I want to make the switch from, although I don't think I need to do it in this, in this room, but I just want to say it anyway. When uh, we were, uh, uh, MPC traditionally thought of different parties with, um, that would collaborate together to do something, um, to, 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 to do some privacy preserver and computation with different private inputs, but with MPC we're really talking about it's just my asset or my secret that I'm splitting because I don't trust myself. That's actually what's happening here. If I trusted myself, then I had no problem putting my key on my mobile because I know that my mobile is safe and secure and everything. Trusting myself doesn't mean that I'm going to steal from myself. Trusting myself means that I can get breached. So what are we going to do? We're going to take a private key, K, and share it, K1 and K2, for example, with additive sharing. And we're going to place shares on different devices and then those shares are the private inputs in the MPC computation. And we look at it in that context, then you know, the classic uh, uh, main properties of MPC of privacy and correctness give us the following guarantees. Privacy means that when we generate a signature, nothing is revealed except that signature. In particular, nothing is learned about the other party's private share or nothing is revealed about the key. Or at least if it is, then it's because the signature is broken and not because the MPC protocol is broken. Correctness is no less important, and correctness tells me that I'm, the only signature that's going to be generated is one that I agree to sign on. This is very, very important, because I might be running a, a two-party protocol with Dan, I'm agreeing to transfer $1,000 to Gilad, but it ends up being that we ended up signing on a million dollars going to Dan because the protocol wasn't correct, it was only private. And it's really important to understand there's no need whatsoever to steal anybody's key in this field if I can steal all of your money. I just need to generate a fraudulent signature that takes all of your money and I'm done. I don't actually need to steal the key. And that's what we call key misuse resistance, which is actually really what we're looking for rather than key theft. Of course, key theft is always the worst because then I steal millions of people's keys and then I do one operation, like at one time I steal from everybody and then you can't recover. So certainly we don't want people to steal keys, don't get me wrong. Uh, 
Okay, uh, again, I want to stress regarding corruptions in the classic MPC type setting. We're thinking about me and Dan. Dan doesn't trust me, justifiably so, because uh, I might try to steal from him. But this isn't the case that we're talking about here. Clearly, if it's like an MPC wallet where my uh, key is shared between my mobile and some service provider, then we don't think that I'm trying to steal from myself. I'm not that stupid. Um, but we also don't think that the service provider is trying to steal from us. At least, again, we should be choosing organizations to work with that we trust. But also, it's, this would be the worst thing for their business model. What we are concerned with is... Uh, an insider, potentially an insider at the service provider, or we're concerned with breaches. We're concerned with my mobile being breached, and that's me being corrupted, and we're concerned with an attack on the service provider that could end up with it being uh, corrupted, whether that attack be an external breach or someone uh, um, you know, updating something incorrectly in, the, in, in their GitHub, or and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll leave that up. Okay, so with an MPC-based wallet, we want to share the key between my, the user device, the mobile, laptop, whatever it is, and the service provider, and uh, we want the following properties. Firstly, we want to make sure that the service provider can't transact without the user uh, agreeing. This is, of course, guaranteed because the, the uh, service provider doesn't hold the key, so of course they just cannot carry the transaction, they don't have enough information. We also want uh, malware on the user's device to not be enough to steal the key. Uh, and they can't because, again, what's on the mobile is not enough. It's only a share of the key. And we also want to mitigate key misuse. And we can do that with policies. For example, if we say that, just like with my bank, I can transfer up to $10,000 a day, for example, you can define a policy that will, give, will set limits now, if I, I could put that policy on my mobile phone as well, the problem is that um, my mobile phone doesn't care about any code that's written there if there's malware. So it can just get the key and sign on something way above it. But if in order to carry out the, the operation, I need the uh, collaboration with the corporation of the service provider, the service provider is going to check the policy before agreeing to carry out the operation. And this is, the, this is, this is where we can get all of the you know, step-up authentication or sending you a message and asking you to verify that indeed you're agreeing to this or, 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 or all different policy, any different policy that we'd like to actually implement, that's up to us. Uh, what about backup? Backup, we talk, I talked about backup a lot in the beginning. So the reason why backup is so hard is because I'm putting a secret that's worth a million dollars, I'm putting it uh, in one place. But when I'm only putting one share of a secret, then uh, this becomes much, much easier because the assumption, my assumption is that if I have that share, <clears throat> it's not enough to carry out the operation if I get to the backup because I'm going to have to go through some rigorous authentication together with the service provider to do a restore from backup operation. We all know that, and if we don't know, we should know, that the weakest point of most authentication systems is the reset, uh, uh, the reset or restore function. But if we're aware of that, then we understand that, okay, so we're going to have to do something very significant, at least when it's a valuable wallet that someone is saying, I, I need to restore from backup. And then, then my life becomes a lot easier, because if I put this key, in the, in this key share in iCloud, uh, then uh, even if it gets stolen, this is nowhere near enough to get my funds. Uh, I just want to stress, though, that the naive implementation that I, that I think we're all thinking about now, where we generate two keys, two, we generate one key, two key shares, one is at my mobile, one is at the service provider, the service provider knows how to back up their share, no problem, I will back up my share in iCloud or something like that, that this doesn't, this is not what we call true self-custody, this is what we would call non-custodial, and I'm not, I don't want to be, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, there's a lot of ramifications to these terms, but in general, full custody means it's all at the exchange, uh, self-custody means I can do everything by myself, and this is sort of like an area in between where neither side can do anything by themselves, but if there's a subpoena against me, I still cannot do operations. And so if we want to, to uh, have actually full self-custody, then we need to add something that we call a censorship-free backup, which means that on an ongoing basis, indeed, 
I will work always with the cooperation of the uh, service provider. But uh, uh, if needed, for some reason, whatever happens, I, I need to be able to just get it by myself. Either they, again, maybe they went bankrupt and there was just no one to speak to there, or there's a subpoena against me, I want to be able to get my funds and then I need censorship for free backup. Yeah. So if, if this sort of uh, setup you're talking about uh, subpoenas, surely if you're backing it up in iCloud, you just need two subpoenas and not one and they can take your money. So the question is, if I'm talking about uh, subpoenas, then you know, if I've put it in iCloud, then we can just, it's just a matter of two subpoenas. So yeah, so firstly, uh, possibly, but you understand that when I say iCloud, I don't mean iCloud. You can do whatever you want with this, right? And, and, and the point is that what you really want is, at least the way I think we should build security products, is you want something that every, the everyday person doesn't need to do anything. Okay, so uh, most of us aren't drug dealers. We certainly don't need to worry about a subpoena. But since you are a drug dealer, sorry for letting everyone know, uh, you, you'll want to put it somewhere else and not just in iCloud. Okay, obviously I'm joking in terms of... The, is that if the, the point of talking about the subpoenas is to say the government can't take your money, but it can. Because if, because if they subpoena, let's say, some service provider, right? And that's no, not necessarily, because there's nothing, there's nothing stopping me from taking that back up and putting it on iCloud, Google Drive, and a disk on key, and printing it out. And because it's not something that is so secret... It's the other way, though. Because, yeah. <laughs> okay, if the government is in control of the service provider with the subpoena, right, then the service provider will no longer sign the sign transactions with you? That's what I said. So that, that's why we have a censorship-free backup. The censorship-free backup is a different backup that enables you to solve that problem. What I talked about now does not give you censorship-free backup. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I meant more of the fact that even if you back it in multiple places, as long as one of those places is subpoenaed... No, 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 I meant... To, you can have the secretary of the client and the secretary of the... When we get to censorship-free backup, you'll see what I do. What we do is, what you, we, what you can do, or what we, I propose, is something that... Uh, uh, essentially gives you the full capability by yourself to re restore from backup. And this again has a little bit of a trade-off with security. So the question is, do you want this or do you not want this? Depends on what wallet you're building, you have to make that decision. I personally think that, by the way, this whole, at least in, in my opinion, for, mo for, for most people living in uh, uh, reasonable countries, I don't think that we should really worry about censorship-free backup, but certainly it's a feature that it's important to, to build, and for some people in some countries, certainly we should, we, it, they, they need it. Any other questions? What time did I start? <laughs> we were just debating it. I think we started at a quarter to Oh, good, okay. All right, so what MPC operations do we need? Obviously, we need to be able to sign. That's pretty obvious. We also need to be able to generate a key uh, with MPC because we want the key to never be exposed. Although I, I do want to stress that it's important to not be too purist here in that it's certainly far better to have a wallet that does uh, a local generation and then splits than having a wallet like uh, that, that most people have today where the key is just always on your phone. But it's also much better to have something which uh, the key is never exposed at any time at any point on the phone. So certainly we want to do key generation. We also want to do something we call refresh. Refresh is something that uh, prevents the attacker from uh, just over time eventually getting to both places and stealing, so you update the sharing. So the sharing is K1 and K2, and at certain intervals you update it to K1 plus R, K2 minus R. It's the same sharing, sharing of the same key, but if you stole K1 and later K2 minus R, you have no information whatsoever about the key. Uh, backup, I, I mentioned, and also we want to uh, get HD wallet support, but I'll talk about uh, what that is and why we want that later on. Okay, so let's talk more about backup, because I actually think the backup is one of the most important elements here, at least in terms of the, if I talked about usability and security, so security, I think it's a major thing to have a key sitting whole on a mobile, I think that's a horrible idea. Um, but in terms of the user experience, it's the backup actually, which is, which is probably the biggest uh, concern. So uh, the first thing uh, I want to talk about with backup is that I want to claim, and this is where we start talking about the subtleties when you start thinking about this in more depth in terms of what we actually need. And uh, what I'm claiming is that we actually need something called publicly verifi verifiable backup. 
And I'll explain why that is the case now. So the obvious way to back up is I generated a key share. The service provider generated a key share. I encrypt. Uh, we have some backup key somewhere. Uh, I encrypt my share under the backup key. The service provider encrypts their share under the backup key, and we're done. But we're talking about a malicious environment. If we're not talking about a malicious environment, then we don't really need to do any of this or... At least maybe we can use semi-honest protocols at least, but, but we've just heard it in the previous talk and many other talks, this truly is a malicious environment, okay? So uh, what happens if one of the devices encrypts the wrong value to backup? This is the attack. Why would you want to do that? Maybe someone wants to make this uh, a wild go out of business or other sabotage. Uh, you basically want to uh, uh, make the backup just be invalid. Now, again, if I'm protecting $50 or $100, I'm not so concerned about this. When I'm protecting $40 billion or hundreds of billion dollars or even just for one person a million dollars, then um, I'd argue for a lot of people even $100,000. Uh, this is a very big deal, and we really want to make sure that we have valid backup. So publicly verifiable backup is where I can verify that the encrypted va value indeed is correct without opening up the encryption. Of course, what we don't want to do is generate the backup and then decrypt and check that it's okay. Why? Because that introduces huge security risk and very often we want that backup key, the key that we're encrypting with, to be very well protected. Uh, that's typically the easier way to do things is you have a backup key that's very well protected and the cipher text you can just put anywhere. So we don't want to bring that decryption key online or utilize it or unlock it or whatever it is, because uh, that introduces significant security risk. So, okay, so given that, I want to propose that we have two backups, one which we call the first or the regular easy to use backup. My argument is that most of the time people are going to need to restore from backup not because there's a subpoena or something's happened, but rather because their phone fell in the toilet or fell under a bus or got lost or they changed phones and the data didn't transfer like it was supposed to. And these are things that if you have 100,000 users, you're not going to see very often. If you have 100 million users, you're going to see them all the time. And if you have a billion users, you're going to see them, I guess, also all the time. <laughs> A bit like uh, infinity plus infinity. So, um, so we want to be able to. We want this restore from backup to be really easy. Again, if we think about bringing this to the masses, we have to make this easy to use. So, this is something. If I lose my phone, it shouldn't be uh, incredibly hard for me to now restore from backup. So, we can think about the following type of idea. The user will have some private decryption key in the cloud backup. By the way, there are many different ways of doing this. So this is just one example. But one example is the, the user has a private decryption key in the cloud backup. The server can provide up, can, server provide, service provider can back up their, local, their, their share locally. We assume that the service provider knows how to do backup. Okay? This is not true of all exchanges. It appears, but it's certainly true of responsible organizations and service providers. So we're assuming the service provider can just back up their share, and the user will back up their share by encrypting it under their uh, encryption key and sending it to the service provider. So the service provider will hold their share and the encryption of the user's shares, user's share encrypted under the user's uh, key where the private key is sitting in iCloud. By the way, there's another nice property of this which is that even if you steal the user's uh, iCloud, it's not enough to do anything because you don't have the ciphertext. We often don't think of the ciphertext as a security measure, but actually it is. If you need the key and the ciphertext, then not having them both available is actually a very good thing. And this also means that it's not enough to, you might have thought naively, we can just put the user's share in the iCloud and uh, then indeed the users, the, then we have to think about, well, can they use that to generate a clone of the phone? If you're doing refresh, no, but, but th this way is just a very, very easy, clear model that it's, it's purely restore from backup. Okay, 
Now, uh, if the user loses their device or whatever happens, then they authenticate to the service provider uh, at some level or another that, that's you know, out of the scope of here. They retrieve their decryption key from their iCloud, and then they uh, uh, decrypt the ciphertext they get from the service provider, rebuild the wallet, and they continue working. Does that make sense? Yes. How does the user prove that they encrypted correctly? So uh, the use, the, we're using publicly verified backup. That's in the next session where I actually have a few mathematical things, just a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm gonna, the technical details of how we solve these challenges in the second, in the second session I'm going to do. Wait, so this is not censorship-resistant? This is not censorship-resistant. This is the first backup. This is the easy-to-use one so that anybody can just restore it. With the same type of user experience you get from everything else you're used to. The second backup is a censorship-free or censorship resistant backup, and um, it's clear that there's a security payment to be made here, but I, I want to go through it and, and, and let's try and think about it in uh, uh, um, exactly what, what the guarantees are. So the idea here is that we're going to have the user hold a private decryption key in a secure environment. That secure environment could be a UBHSM, for example, or if in a good phone, maybe it's a biometric uh, protected, protected uh, secure enclave that requires something special to unlock, uh, pre preferably if it's a secure UI, which there are some, I think high-end Sa Samsung phones have this, where you can have the, something on your screen be directly linked to the secure enclave so that uh, uh, you're not doing, doing something you think you're not doing. Again, all secure enclaves come with a certain caveat in terms of their security, but they're far better than nothing. Um, the service provider will now, unlike in the previous case, will now encrypt their share under, also under the user's public backup key, this special protected backup key that's in the enclave or whatever it is, and the user will now hold the, uh, that's, that, those ciphertexts. So unlike beforehand, where the ciphertexts are the service provider, here actually the user holds them, but the decryption key is somewhere more safe, or at least we hope more safe. And um, we can store the backup ciphertext in the cloud or on the, on the device. And what's important here is that the key is never exposed even when you're generating the backup. Uh, of course, the security of this is very much dependent on the secure, how secure it is to access that key. But, uh, um, you know, depending on the level of the, the if it's a UBHSM, I think that's something we're very comfortable with. One thing to notice here is you, some people start thinking, okay, but what happens if I lose my phone and there's a subpoena? Okay. No, no, you know, it's not, the, the, nothing is ever going to be 100%, uh, 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 not in security and, and not in backup. But I do want to stress that once you're doing backup, the more advanced users can always do more. And there are also things like, when you see that the user's wallet has gone above a certain amount, you can tell them, listen, it was great until now you were playing around, you had $150 in your wallet, you now have $300,000 in your wallet, and maybe you should start thinking about doing X, Y, Z. And they're probably at that time, if they have that amount of money, they're probably you know, more uh, um, experienced, or also if they have a lot of money, it means you're earning a lot of money from them, so you can afford to pay money to help them out to, to, uh, uh, to protect it better. So there are a lot of things that we can do to, to make this better. And when the user needs to export by themselves, here they're just getting out of the system. There's, there's, by the way, with the store from backup, it's important to distinguish between restore back to the previous situation, in which case you never want to expose the key, not during restore, obviously, and export out of the system, where, which would be in the case of censorship freeness, and here we just decrypt in one local place, you have your key, go and do whatever you want, because now you're already outside of the scope of the, the, uh, the wallet in any case. Yeah, I'm curious, there's another time where uh, you generate a two out of three share, where the, where the service provider holds one share and the user holds two shares, one of the shares is in the UBHSM. Yeah, you can do this in many, many different ways. There's, yeah, it's equivalent, you can do social, you can also do like social backup, you can do many, many different things where you have shares in different places. Uh, um, the, the, the reason, or the, the, one of the advantages with this is that if you only, let's say all you have is an iPhone, 
and you don't have a UBHSM, and it's not like you don't have a huge amount, then, then this doesn't require anything special. It requires a standard uh, public key, ECIS public key that the iPhone Enclave gives you, and I don't need to have any oper any, anything special done inside a TE. Uh, what you're asking for is uh, a secure storage. I guess you could... No, that would be a problem because then how, if I have two shares, how do I encrypt the share without, it being, without the key being exposed? So I have two of three, I, I don't think, I, I don't know how to do that without exposing the key at a point generation. Uh, you know, I, I'm confused. Uh, what are the two shares? The two shares are on the... The two shares are your, either, your either ECDSA key or maybe the seed for the HD wallet. <coughs> so we generate them MPC between the service provider and the wallet. In the first backup, they're backed up, like we said. In the second backup, there's a key that belongs to the user in some way, and the user will get both ciphertexts. But, but the, the service provider will encrypt before they send, so the key is never exposed during backup generation. I didn't answer your question? No, but... We've got plenty of time. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm confused. Uh, I'm thinking shares, uh, one share is of the service provider, one share is of the user. That's right, yeah. So the user doesn't have two shares. Yeah, so the user will back up their own share uh, uh, locally, or they're encrypted under that key. The service provider, the user will give the service provider their public key for and their UBHSM and will say, please encrypt it for me. The service provider will back it up, send it to the, encrypt it with publicly verifiable encryption, send it to the user, the user will verify that indeed this is a valid backup and store it. It's a single share for the user. A single share for the user, a single share for the service provider, I don't understand. Why, why does the user decrypt both shares? Encrypt both shares? When you, when, when you want to uh, export. It's two of two sharing. It's two of two. I want, this is for, for when I export. If I want to get out, if I now want to re recover, I'm not doing restore into an MC system, I'm just getting out, I'm exporting some, locally decrypting both shares, I add them together, and I have my ECDSA key. No? To me, there's one share that stays at the, at, at the service. Yeah, no, this is the censorship resistant backup. The regular backup, if you don't want sense, if you not, if you want, if you're going for what we call the non-custodial scenario, you don't have this. You have one at the user, one at the service provider, and that's it. Um, and the way we back up is like, for example, two ciphertexts at the service provider and the key at the user. This is if you want a full self-custody solution, so that you're, you you know that you can you have your money no matter what happens to the service provider. Anyway, I want to say that the, the places where you think that the censorship is more uh, probable and don't have a high uh, 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 phones. Uh, I understand. I understand that. I understand that. So you good at? Yeah. Why is this fundamentally better than just having the, the HSM store the, the, the master decryption, the, the master secret key itself? So... Um, so again, if, if what you're talking about is, uh, that, that, that certainly is, a, for the censorship-free backup, that's fine. Like, it's essentially the same thing, but the problem is, how do you get there? No, Dan says I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, the HSM is offline, but, ah, so it means you have to plug it in. But the, the, quite, the main problem is, how do you get to that state? How do you, how do you send the key, how do you get the key there without it ever being exposed? And that's a problem that you can't really solve. Is that what you meant to say? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so why does this solve the mnemonic and usability problem? Because now it's all automatic and it's safe. I don't, I don't need to give the, the user a mnemonic. In fact, I won't. Once I don't have a mnemonic, I now also solve a lot of the social engineering problems. Not everything, because nothing is 100% secure, but a lot of them. And uh, it can be done fully automatically. So I just, you know, plug in and I go. Uh, by the way, very interesting, uh, interesting thing is um, there is a lot of like uh, um, in like Web3 things in gaming, there's a lot of uh, uh, use or starting to use these types of wallets, but there's a huge amount of people who 
start the process. In fact, I think the vast, over 90% start the process and then drop out. Why, why is that? Because let's say you're playing a game. I never play games, so I don't know how that works, but I assume some people here play games. Uh, let's say you're playing some, I mean, digital games. I play chess with my kid, don't worry. Um, your chess, that's the game he said, my God. Uh, um, so when I was a kid, we had, uh, um, what was it called, Atari with Space Invaders? It's true, it was cool. Um, anyway, so, uh, so you're playing a game and you get this thing pops up and says you've got enough points, whatever, you can now uh, get an, uh, you know, uh, uh, an NFT or, or, or you can buy the skin and you have full ownership, whatever it is, whatever it is. Just install the wallet. Cool, you say yes. Now suddenly you have to download something and you get told when you're setting this up, here's a mnemonic and you need to store it and if you don't, you're going to lose everything you own and you say, I, I just want to play a game, really, leave me alone. Right? And, and again, this is a huge barrier to adoption, and so being able to have this be fully automatic means I can just say, oh, cool, yeah, great, I'll take it, and I can just continue, which is what we're looking for. Uh, again, one of the other features that we want here, because it's the... Em Sorry, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask, because uh, for me, uh, the mnemonics are problematic itself because there are like 10 words, and it's considered safe mnemonic in current times. Uh, does the whole technique you are describing allow you to consider less words mnemonic safe enough, probably? So, um, I'll take a step back that uh, in, in what we're considering, in principle, there's no need for any mnemonic. The question is, do you want an HD world that's comp compatible or not? But I'll, I'll disagree in terms of the, the mnemonic is simply an encoding. That's all it is. And if you're choosing the mnemonic from, if you're choosing the words from a space that's big enough and you get to entropy 128 bits, then you're good. <coughs> the question was like when um, the mnemonic itself is also like a good way to store data, just remember it uh, if you want to uh, have it safe. And like when you describe the process of like backuping in iCloud, I don't expect your normal uh, private key to be like remember, rememberable. Yeah, so I, I, again, I think that, uh, uh, firstly, I agree with you. My, I'm, I'm not thinking of putting a mnemonic there, but I think that it's naive to say that I'm going to have a um, million dollars in backup with some 10 random words that I'm supposed to remember forever. Right, this is... I don't know, maybe you can do it. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, with one word, I wouldn't agree to do it. Um, so you have like, you know, what Signal has this really nice thing that when uh, every now and then it sort of prompts you for your pin. Because if you're not using it all the time, there's no way you're going to remember. The only reasonable passwords I can ever remember is like to my laptop because Coinbase forces me to use it all the time. It's like a 15 character password. So uh, you, you can't remember these things unless you're doing it all the time. And so I would not trust even the, the fact, the way I view mnemonics is simply as a good way of encoding, encoding a 128-bit string. That's memorizable, I just don't believe it. It's easier to write than run letters, that's it. Yeah, for most people. <laughs> Yeah, there's checksums also. There's a lot of good things about the mnemonic, but the best thing about the mnemonic is not having one at all. Because again, we are not, we are not the standard uh, uh, user. We have to accept that. And I think actually it's one of the big problems in this field, if you ask me, that it's a really technology-driven field, and a lot of the people building the stuff are the people that are so deep inside it that they don't understand the experience of someone who has no idea What's an L1 versus an L2? Why should I need to know? And what, uh, I chose the L1 instead of the L2 and suddenly my transaction fees were so high, I didn't know that there was such a difference. You can't build, you cannot build an uh, build application which works in this way and have, expect everybody to use it. Okay, other features are that uh, since the service provider has to be involved in every single operation, there's no problem enforcing policies on both sides. So the service provider will ch check the policy before carrying out an operation, or they can run fraud mitigation mechani mechanisms like my credit card company and so on and so forth, so forth and restore from backup. The easy one uh, just looks like password reset to my bank, and that's what people are used to or want to use. Okay, we're all good? Good. 
What about HD wallet support? Um, so what's an HD wallet? I think we all know, but I'll say it anyway. You have some seed and you use a pseudorandom function to derive many keys from it. And the mnemonic is the source of that seed. Um, actually, I don't think we really need an HD wallet in this case. Because once you, are, um, you have an automatic way of backing up, there's no problem. So I have a public key with a private key in my iCloud. There's no real problem with every time uh, I generate a key, I just uh, back it up, because it's all automatic. So we, can, we don't really need to have an HD wallet in order to, um, in order to, to do what we want to do. And if people are saying, what about normal derivations, because people like doing that on, on Bitcoin and so on and so forth, that's no problem. You can do a normal derivation from any key. It doesn't actually have to be a key that you did hardened derivation from. You can pretend you can give something that looks indistinguishable from a full HD wallet, but instead of deriving from the seed to a, a hardened derived key, you just generate a key and say, yes, we derived it. That's the beauty of uh, pseudo-randomness, that it's indistinguishable. So um, I don't believe you actually need it, but, um, but there are some places where, you know, where exactly we're backing this up and how we're backing it up, and maybe there are times we'd want to have the backup uh, do backup only once and, and rely on that. So if I have a lot, a lot of money, maybe I don't want to just put it in one place. I want to be able to put my ciphertext in a few different places. And I'd like to do this only once. So if I'm in a, in a censorship-free scenario and I have a lot of money, I want to do something more significant. So I just want to do this once in the very beginning and then be safe from then on. And so if I, then I want an HD wallet. Okay? So this is what the uh, uh, um, BIP uh, compliant, BIP 3239 compliant HD wallets look like. You have some uh, entropy, which is essentially your, your mnemonic over here. You do HMAC SHA 512 uh, to, uh, um, to derive your, the roots or, or the master node. And then from here, you do derivations. You do... Essentially, this is according to uh, a BIP44. At least you do three derivations. And so it's like one, two, three derivations. And these are all the hardened addresses. And then you do normal derivations afterwards. And each step along here is HMAC SHA 512. OK? So for those of you thinking MPC, HMAC SHA 512. And this is obviously Hugo's fault for the way he did HMAC. He didn't think of us back then. So, um, why do we want BIP compliance? So, firstly, standard methods require no explanation. That's always a good answer, right? People are used to it, are not doing anything different, and that's just e easy. Uh, but there are a couple of other more important reasons. One is importing a wallet. So, let's say you have a wallet, you have MetaMask. That's fine, it made sense because there wasn't anything better, but now there are these cool MPC wallets, and you want to import your wallet into the MPC wallet. So uh, you might think, well, that's not a problem, I just import one key at a time, and, uh, and that's fine. Or, or you import the mnemonic, you derive all the keys, and then you put the keys into the wallet. But there are subtleties in the world that things don't actually work that way. Because what happens if this new MPC wallet, which is really cool, doesn't support everything that MetaMask does? And so I'm still going to do some things on MetaMask. I'm going to derive additional keys for some new DAP on MetaMask that isn't yet supported in my MPC wallet. And then afterwards, I want to transfer. Uh, then afterwards, I'll just expect that I should be able to get it over here as well. Or maybe I want to use two wallets in parallel. And I'm going to derive additional keys, and, uh, uh, but my new wallet actually doesn't work that way. So you have to really understand that although both of these wallets look the same, they actually behave under the hood completely differently. And again, we're not building a wallet for the people in this room. We're building it for the rest of the world and explaining to them that they're, although you can transfer things and everything will work, they don't work in the same way, so you can't always transfer things is not a very good idea at all. Um, also, with exports, uh, in general, when you build a product, you want the product to... Uh, you, vendor lock-in is a bad thing. We generally say that we want people to use our products because they want to use our products and not because we've locked them in. Um, 
Of course, we don't really care that much, but we want to say that at least. No, but, but uh, honestly, the, it's, a, it's an obstacle to using a product if uh, it's not compliant because I'm locked in. If I decide I don't want to continue using this and it's very hard to move off, that's, that's a problem. And uh, if the other wallets are using BIP32, BIP39, then um, I want to be able to export to them and being compliant is very advantageous. Isn't from a security perspective the right way to export is by sending the money? Yes, it's also very expensive and very... Uh, um, and, and can have significant overhead if I have many keys. Yeah, but like, I'm concerned that uh, someone will move from a company using MPC to another company using MPC via an export and import, and at that point you ask yourself... No, so what I, so, so the cups, I have a few things to say here. One thing is, which is it's very unfortunate is, and needs to be improved, is that there isn't a lot of collaboration between these different wallet providers. One thing I'd want to see is something that we've seen, we know very well from the legacy HSM world, is uh, uh, secure, uh, um, secure transfer uh, uh, protocols. It's not difficult to do. From one MPC to another, it's really easy. You just separately encrypt shares. Uh, but even just that, I want to go from an MPC wallet to a ledger wallet. The ledger wallet should be able to output a key. Forget it. I want to go from MetaMask to a ledger wallet or, or, or something like that. I want to be able to get a key, wrap it, and, then, and, and send it encrypted and import it into the other device. We don't have that capability today, which is nuts. It's nuts. It's like this is stuff that was solved 30 years ago. So uh, uh, certainly we need to also be able to do that. Um, yeah, you know, this, there, we still have a long way to go, but, but we'll get there. Um, okay. So it, it also it's in terms of exporting keys, there's no technical problem in exporting a key, but you can't always, if everything's, for example, MetaMask will accept a key. I don't have to give them a mnemonic. I can give them, an a, 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 I can give them specific keys and not a mnemonic, that's fine. But I don't think Ledger does. I'm pretty sure Ledger doesn't. So, you know, one thing you'd say is, well, if you're a big enough organization, then, they, then, then you'll force them to do it. But, but in general, compatibility has a lot of advantages. OK, so uh, fortunately, we have this great theorem from the late 80s that we can do anything. And in particular, we can also deal with Hugo's HMAC uh, SHA-512 uh, uh, construction. By the way, since we brought back, it's not HMAC it's true. If it was HMAC SHA-1 with only one gate inside, it would be much easier. I agree. <laughs> it just proves the success of HMAC that they realized that for a random oracle, they'd be using HMAC. Exactly. Arguably, it's Peter's fault for using HMACs. But in any case, um, so, so, how does, so, so let's start with BIP39. So there's BIP32, there's BIP39, there's BIP44. BIP32 BIP is that tree I showed you beforehand. BIP44 is just a standard way of defining addresses with, a, with how you do the derivation. And BIP39 is a way of going from a mnemonic to a seed because BIP32 takes a seed. So how does BIP39 work? You take a mnemonic and you do 2048 iterations of HMAC512 to get a seed. Now here it's in blue, says Yehuda's rant, so I have to do a rant. This annoys, this, uh, this kills me, this one, right? So where does this come from? This comes from? Password hashing. Password hashing, exactly, exactly. So I was told by someone that the reason why they added this was to increase entropy. I don't want to go there. But, um, <laughs> but this comes from password hashing. Now, if we're looking at doing, you know, bre breaking passwords en masse at an organization, this is very, very helpful. Does it help us at all here? So I argue absolutely not. Why? Well, you know, let's, let's, not, let's, not, let's not exaggerate. If, if I'm using a mnemonic which is not randomly chosen, like you should, and has very low entropy, this is completely meaningless. If I'm using something in the middle that has reasonable entropy, then this can help. But if it has reasonable entropy, it means A, you won't remember it anyway, so you might as well chosen a full entropy one. And why bother? And if I'm using something that has 120 bits of entropy, then doing this is completely worthless. So this just makes no sense whatsoever. And in fact, any reasonable wallet chooses a mnemonic for you. You don't, you don't choose your mnemonic, it just gives you the mnemonic and you write it down. So it has full entropy anyway. This is just stupid. And what it means 
is that, um, and that's on video, I don't mind, I don't mind the whole world knowing that's what I think. <laughs> so let's calculate the size of a single garbled circuit, okay, for doing BIP39 is as follows. So 58,120 gates is what we need for a SHA-512, unless Samuel has improved it since then, and uh, you need four of those uh, for each HMAC. I'll show you later on why you need exactly four, because the path is small, so you need four. So that's only 476 million gates, approximately, which is about 14 gigabytes of uh, memory for, of, of bandwidth for a single uh, garbled circuit. That is a big problem. We're not going to be doing that reasonably anytime soon. This is just not, not reasonable. So it means the BIP39 pretty much we have to give up on if we, if, uh, if we want to do an MPC. What about BIP32? So BIP32 says, okay, so let's give up on the mnemonic to, to seed uh, step, which by the way, everyone should say, well, what are you thinking? What are you thinking about BIP39 versus BIP32? Come on. Who cares, right? Product managers care. Because the, cause the, cause the other uh, wallets, a lot of them will only take the mnemonic and not even the seed. But it's a really small change for them to accept the seed, and so hopefully, eventually, that will change. But, but people do care. Okay, so we run, uh, what about BIP32? With BIP32, now we just need to derive each key, and we're running three HMAC SHA-512, right? Because you're going from the seed, uh, sort of going to BIP44, it's three derivations. Uh, but isn't that expensive? I'm keeping you in suspense for the next uh, stage of the talk, so you're going to come back after the break. I'm not giving you the answer yet. Uh, okay, but now I want to talk about subtleties. I have 10 minutes, right? 12 minutes, right? So I'm going to talk about some of the subtleties when we're doing HT derivation. So um, MPC uh, tells you that the process for computation is secure. And it works exactly the same as if I was to interact with a trusted third party and send my inputs. Great. But what input? So you're going to play the millionaire's game with someone, and you're going to input your salary. Why are you going to input the correct salary? You can input whatever you want. And it's the same thing here. If I'm starting from a seed, and I'm doing derivation, who says that each time I run this MPC, I input the same seed? Seed sh or sh same share of the seed. Obviously, what are we doing? We have a share of the seed on the mobile, a share of the seed of the service provider, and we're now going to input shares of that seed. We backed up the original seed, but if now, again, I input the incorrect seed share, then my backup becomes completely garbage. So we have to think about, uh, do we need to, how can we force the parties to input the same seed share so that my backup doesn't get corrupted? That's input enforcement. At, yes? Uh, here it's additive sharing. Of course, you can start thinking if I'm at, if I'm at, if I'm adding additional uh, something to the shares and it can be validated on both sides. Then again, that's you're trying. You're, you're saying how do we solve the problem? But yeah, isn't this just a problem of VSS? Not really, because you have to have, have your VSS in, connect into your two-party protocol. So if you wanted to do VSS or something, but how are you doing VSS for a two-party? I'm going to put that into a symmetric protocol because you need to do HMAC derivation. The only way you need to know how to do that is using a symmetric protocol. So any cost for that verification is going to be thrown into a Boolean circuit. And that can be expensive. This, there are many, many solutions. I'll show one later on. But I think the really important thing is understanding there's a problem to start with. And if you look around, most people who are thinking about MPC wallets never even th thought about this problem. At least that's, Dan says maybe I'm wrong, but I don't know. But that's at least from what I've seen. Uh, the same thing comes with the output, though. So you're running this MPC operation to derive a key, and you get, end up getting as output shares of the key. Okay, now what would you, uh, um, what would you generally do is you would want to... Um, now use those, the, the output of the, this derivation in the key generation protocol. Because that's how all key generation protocols work. You begin by each party randomly sampling their share of the key and then running something. So instead of randomly sampling, let's take what comes out of 
that, 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 that two-party MPC, well, two PC, maybe I should say, and, and then use those shares. Um, and the problem is, again, we can maybe enforce the input, we ran the derivation, but then in the next stage, I just use something completely different, and again, my backup is no longer viable. So you could say, oh, that's fine. I can just, imp I can just compute the public key also inside the circuit. And if I compute the public key inside the circuit and output it to both parties, then we can verify that the key we generated is actually valid. The problem is that would add tens of millions of gates. We may as well just do BIP39. No, I'm just joking. So uh, it's also just not going to be reasonable. So we need to add also input and output enforcement mechanisms. I'll talk about that also in the next session. Um, OK, so if we have a BIP compliant wallet, what, how, 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 you know, what are the different types of, 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 of HD wallets or compliant wallets we can have? So one is when we, we, we for, for import, okay, so if, now if we're importing, there's no reason to MPC, okay, in other words, I have a MetaMask wallet, in that wallet I have a key, or I have my mnemonic written there, or the seed written there, I might as well just generate the tree locally and split it. There's no point writing something in MPC that was already local two minutes ago, okay, but then any later hardened derivations I'll now do with BIP32. Because I already have the structure set up, and now when you do, you're adding a new asset, there's a new blockchain that someone here has proposed and is doing really well, but it uses it, and but we now need to add a new key for that blockchain or for that DAP, we can just do BIP32 derivation for it. Uh, if it's a new wallet, and I want the wallet to be fully BIP39 compliant, then I don't have a solution. The only thing you can do is just locally generate it and split like in the previous case because you want a full BIP39 compliant wallet and we just can't support that now. I don't know how to do it. Uh, if I want a new wallet that's BIP32 compliant but not BIP39 compliant, then I can run these derivations for every key. It's going to be expensive and take time. Um, numerous seconds, tens of seconds maybe to generate a reasonable number of keys, uh, but it's certainly possible to do. Another possibility is to uh, generate a new wallet. If it's an important wallet, imported wallet, make it BIP39 compliant, but a new wallet just to use a completely different uh, uh, derivation method, which is not, uh, which is MPC friendly. Okay, so what's an MPC friendly derivation? It's, uh, it's going to use a, uh, a function, a, uh, I don't know if it's a pseudorandom function, but it's going to use a derivation method that is uh, going to be much more amenable to efficient MPC than HMAX SHA-512. We're going to also though, have to take care of input and output enforcement as well, because without that, actually, it's very easy, but with that, it becomes hard. OK, so um, to sum up this first, just understanding the landscape and the issues involved session, uh, I strongly believe that MPC wallets can really solve the problems of usability that we have in, in the current space. Uh, in terms of backup, we can get the effect of only having uh, of automatic backup and uh, uh, not having to be so worried about it because only one share or only a, a secret key that, that encrypts a cipher text somewhere else. We can get the effect of like a password reset. We can have for policy enforcement and so on and so forth. But we need to be able to solve all of these problems and more. There are a couple of other really uh, 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 nice ones like EDD, EDDSA key compatibility, which I'm not going to reveal to you until the next session, just to make sure you come back. Thank you.